like the point of this episode is that like the rule of cool supersedes almost every critical thought that I have about a movie. And let's get into our propaganda. Episode one, we're talking Transformers and Battleship. Do you remember when Transformers came out? <laughs> that that was a life changing moment. It was. The year it was like tw- 2007. 2007. I hate to be all millennial nostalgic on it, but this coincided with Halo Three coming out around the same time. Coincided with I want to say Assassin's Creed was soon afterwards. Bioshock. A lot of video games. But I also remember it was a stylized time. And Transformers, who was the front runner, took the lead on this one. Those were the glory days. Not to be all annoying about it, but wow, what a time. Let's talk about other hits from 2007. Hot Rod. That was a movie that shaped every boy's answer to tell us something about yourself. <laughs> I'm Dave and I like to party. <laughs> I'm Bill yeah. and I like to party. Okay, how many more times are going to hear this? Yeah, what a good one. I Am Legend came out then. Big thriller. But I don't know if anything, at least to me, was as important as Transformers. Watching watching Megan Fox bend over the hood of a car saying, oh, your camshafts are a little tight. (laughs) The number of guys who I knew who had (laughs) Megan Fox posters directly following that movie. We're going to talk about the military here, but I watched Transformers 1 and Transformers 2 in preparation for this. And I'm remembering that, like, my whole puberty was defined by, like, Megan Fox rewrote my brain during this time in my life. (laughs) (laughs) Rightfully so. I'm not ashamed. If we're talking about Transformers, let's let's get into a little bit of the background and let's talk the trivia for two seconds because I think it's important in context of militainment. Transformers, directed by Michael Bay. The three writers, Roberto Orci, O-R-C-I, Orci, I want to say, Alex Kurtzman and John Rogers. So Roberto and Alex worked together on the J.J. Abrams Star Treks. They both worked on Fringe, another J. Abrams, The Island, Mission Impossible 3, Cowboys vs. Aliens. Alex Kurtzman had one big blight in the last few years in which he wrote The Mummy with Tom Cruise. Not such a big hit. <laughs> John Rogers had some interesting choices. Catwoman, Wolf, Queen of the Razzie Awards. The Core, less memorable in Armageddon. And then also just recently did Marry Me, which was that J-Lo Owen Wilson movie oh. from a couple years ago. So an interesting trio here. Alex and Roberto, of course, worked a little bit more. Michael Bay, we just know what he's done. He's Mr. Explosion. Um, if we're talking about producers, though, Steven Spielberg's on this list as a executive producer. I don't know. Executive producers, are they just throwing their name on something? Like, is it like an investment? Like, oh, I own a stock in Disney. I own a stock in Transformers. So here's what I would say about executive producers (laughs) and producing in general. We've talked to a handful of indie producers who seem to do a lot more than maybe I would expect from someone higher up. But an executive producer is mostly like a high-ranking member of the production team that could be a certain number of things. It could be the person who's put up a bunch of money to help fund the film to get started. That I don't think was Steven Spielberg for this. It could be someone who has the big creative vision like Steven Spielberg on the Jurassic World movies. He was an executive producer to make sure they didn't go too far off the rails. An executive producer could be someone who only sees the marketing and distribution. So that could be like literally a businessman who is now an executive producer, but they want the credit. It could be like a executive producer who handles all the legal stuff. So there's all these like weird games of what does it actually mean? I think at least for me looking at this, Steven Spielberg is like, Oh, I love big movies. I'd like to come on as a little bit of a consulting role as an executive producer. Make sure you don't lose the plot, Michael, not too many explosions. (laughs) And I'm going to guess that's where his, his role ended. But again, cool to know he was involved. As far as the cast goes, Shia LaBeouf, Sam Witwicky, he's fantastic. 
we knew him from even Stevens. And then we a couple other movies we just talked about recently, the greatest game ever played. Megan Fox making her huge debut as Michaela Baines. Josh Duhamel. <laughs> Duhamel. Uh, uh, yeah, Josh D as Captain Lennox. Tyrese Gibson as the USAF Tech Sergeant Epps, which, by the way, just how they list him on the credits says militainment in one yeah, sentence. Okay, And their names, too, like Captain Lennox. And Epps, like, Epps. what great names. Yeah. You know, they're, just like, they're just like, oh, this guy's cool. And trustworthy. John Voigt as Defense Secretary John Keller. You'd vote for John Keller for president. John Turturro as Agent Simmons. Fun. And the last little bit here. The budget was estimated to be about $150 million, usually about double that. A double for the total, if you account for print and advertising. And $709 million worldwide in 2007. Is pretty huge. I always say that doesn't even account for a part of the business we don't have today, which is DVD, Blu-ray, and syndication selling out to cable channels, which Transformers did a great job. (laughs) So we've got a huge box office hit. And before we go into notes, a little trivia. The DOD freaking love this movie. They were (laughs) so hyped for this film that... (laughs) <laughs> the Department of Defense provided their support, the largest project they assisted since Black Hawk Down in 2001. Oh, my gosh. They provided vehicles, as we see, for all the Decepticons, as well as some of the Autobots and all the soldiers using them. They allowed for the F-22 and CV-22 aircraft to be filmed, which was the first time they've been seen to film since the 2003 Hulk. They are very choosy about like showing their actual airplanes that they're using. They're like... That's why you see a lot of movies where they have F-16s or F-18s, old models. They're like, we're not going to give you the good stuff. This one, they were like, nope, (laughs) we are showing you exactly how great we are. And they provided tons of soldiers as the extras, as we see in so many scenes, as well as authentic uniforms for all the actors, which, again, is not always a given. As part of this, the filmmakers provided an advanced screening of Transformers to all the soldiers who worked on it free of charge. That makes sense. Just a star-spangled handshake. That's all you can imagine right now. And then the last little bit of trivia before we go. Megan Fox was at a Linkin Park concert. And when it was over, the band walked up and they were like, hey, we've heard about live action Transformers. We want our song. In. And she was the one who connected Linkin Park with Michael Bay and the team. Oh and they're my like, gosh. we got a song for you, which is now a great song, but also it's a meme. Everyone it is. is just, it's just so iconic. Yeah. So fun. DOD and Lincoln Park both love Transformers. Yeah. Color me not surprised that this is like the DOD, one of the DOD's like biggest involvements in movies at the time. Yeah. Um, just because like it's Michael Bay, and I know Michael Bay is the biggest, uh, pardon my the only word that's coming to my brain, the biggest cuck for the military in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. And uh watching the movie, so like we can get into that now. This is just straight military porn. A hundred percent. Like it doesn't matter that like U S military helicopters are blowing up or whatever. And like soldiers are dying. Like that that stuff aside, this is just military porn. The opening scene of the black Hawk helicopter coming into the base and guitar and then transforming and blowing. That is a beautiful scene. Like I just like opening scene is amazing. So Michael Bay from the sweeping shots with the sunset, with the military dialogue going back and forth as they're checking and rechecking the, the aircraft. Yeah. It is quintessential Michael Bay, and it is also pornographic. <laughs> I had one little film nerd in the basement moment where continuity-wise, we've got that amazing sunset, but it's also nighttime. And he thought that sunset pic was so sexy and military-esque, he had to throw it in there, even if it didn't fit with continuity. Yeah. And you got to say, good job, Michael. <laughs> honestly he truly like he, he goes for so much appeal over like continuity because it like the plane lands at sunset and then all of a sudden it's like dark so it's like how long is the plane sitting there for like, an hour or two yeah. before they decided to engage with it <laughs> yeah it's it's one of those times where and i guess we're going to get into our criteria in just a minute but there's just so much badassery around it. Even knowing afterwards it's about to become a bad guy, you can't help but like it. It's the Darth Vader moment. He made a helicopter Darth Vader, 
And it's just yeah. hard to do that immediately in a film where I had never watched the the show growing up, the animated show. I knew about the toys. I knew friends who liked it because of their parents. But I was like, Transformers is old. Like, we watched Beast Wars, which was the redo, the yeah. 90s version. But I didn't have the same connection. But I remember sitting in the theater watching that going, okay, the noise, the sound design, the way it looks, and this thing just blowing up this base was so cool. You couldn't help but love it. And yes. that's how he starts the movie. He's like, I'm going to destroy the military, and they're going to help you out at the end. Yeah. I think it's interesting that we have, at the very beginning, it's just the military for the most part, right? Yeah. Josh du- Duhamel <laughs> and Tyrese Gibson and such run into the desert. You have these moments of saving a kid and then from the explosion on the airfield. And then they're like going into his town and reminding everyone, hey, we're here to protect you. Very interesting knowing where we were with Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. and everything else. And just all these moments of American exceptionalism, being brave, fighting a force you can't beat, yeah. but still believing you can. Yeah. It and just... then they're like sitting there, they're like, oh, I socks at Fenway, a warm beer. And they're just talking about all these like super American things. And then your own patriotic heart goes, oh, yeah, the socks at Fenway and a warm beer. Oh, and mama's alligator is so good. <laughs> Josh Duhamel saying, I just can't wait to hold my baby girl for the first time. Oh, first off, it had gosh. to be a girl. Second <laughs> off, he's got to have something, a baby. How long has he been deployed? Who knows? Anyways, it's just, it. it's every trope and cliche packaged into one thing. And yet again, it works. Even being aware of what we're watching, we're like, yeah, it just feels like Americana. These are the good yeah. guys. Yep, they are the good guys. And not only are they the good guys, but they're like they're far they're funny, they're charming. Yeah. Like the whole like we're jumping ahead in the story, but like the whole battle with Scorpionok where the Scorpion won and he's trying to place the call into the Pentagon, which I don't know if you can actually place a call into the Pentagon with some <laughs> cell phone. Like I think yeah. it's more complicated complicated than that. Yeah. But he's having the back and forth with the agent in India or whatever. And he's like, no, I don't want the premium package. And there's just so much fun back and forth between all the soldiers. It's like, are they fighting for their life or are they having a good time right now? Yeah, it makes it feel like both, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. For a moment, I was like, should I have joined? Are we just going to be buddies <laughs> chumming it up while fighting the bad guys? Yeah, it's just, it's so American. It's so fun. And I guess this is partially why if we're talking about global reviews of American exceptionalism and militainment, why other countries have probably been shrugging the whole time. A lot of them have. There are probably some youth and otherwise who are like, yeah, America is dope. Check this out. But at least when I did my master's program and elsewhere, a lot of people were just like, oh, les I, Americans. Oh, man, you guys think you're just the coolest. And when you look at Hollywood, you're like, yeah, we really do. <laughs> we well, really do. We, we think we're the coolest, but when you look at how we're portrayed in the movies, we are the coolest. Oh, yeah. I don't see the, I don't see the French military being betrayed like we portray our military. I don't think they make movies by the French military, <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> it, it, it's the Independence Day carryover. It's the world needs saving. We are the world police. And that is just hammered in consistently in Transformers. There is a moment late, late, late in the movie, if we're talking plot-wise, in which they're like, oh, yeah, other countries are preparing and they have got to fight their own Transformers. We don't even see a, a news special. We don't see anything about it. It is no, all that's American. in Battleship. That's oh, in that Battleship. Is- Oh, that is in Battleship. Yeah, we're getting there. They share so much DNA, but Darn that's it. a Battleship plot. And I remember that. I remember being like, so we're just going to not address that again? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good call then. In Transformers, yeah. they don't even have the rest of the world. It's just they us. Don't, no, they don't. In Transformers 2 and 3, they do have... No, Transformers 2, they go to Egypt and there yeah. is like Jordanians and stuff, but it's an American affair. It's an American Come movie. Yeah. So yeah, you mentioned the sound design. This is one of the things that I actually love about the Transformers movies is the sound design of the robots actually transforming. Beautiful. And then the sound of the guns and the bullets and the explosions. Like they time it with the soundtrack so that they're the, the, I like in the special features for Transformers 3, there is the scene where Optimus Prime is shooting his gun and they went in and they played with the tonality of of, of the, 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 the gun shooting so that it, harmonized with the soundtrack that was playing and so that he was shooting on beat with the song oh my I'm like gosh. that is just, it's just artistry and that stuff is just all over the place it's just michael bay love him or hate him everything is just dripping 
in cinema, in just like raw, powerful, punch you in the gut, this is beautiful kind of cinema. That's why regardless of how you feel about militainment, propaganda, old IP, if you're talking about the fact that they adapted this to live action, whatever you want to say, he does a great job. Yeah, and does. I remember liking the second one, not loving it as much, but they've made so many of these movies and they still continue to do well. There is a spot for this level of cinematic respect for an otherwise like child's toy story. And this movie, like you're saying, it's just so well done on every scene. And we all make fun of his explosions, but his explosions kick ass. They do. From the desert with the scorpion to the middle of the city to, okay, Bumblebee's first fight with the Ford Mustang. The cop one. The cop one. Yeah, yeah, the A-cab car. Anyways, yeah. any way you slice it, each scene was stylistic and done. And I will say the CGI holds up and it looks fantastic. Yeah, I know it does. Every scene, you're just like, man, did they make this look right? Yeah. Although I, so here's what I have, what I did notice, and this probably is part of just Michael Bay's like film art, like his style, but yeah. also probably with militainment. Toxic masculinity is everywhere in this thing, Thank everywhere you. from Sam Witwicky, his dog, to yeah. the way that the military guys talk to each other, to the way that the high school kids are like at a party, and it's all. So toxically male. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The dog's wearing diamonds. Hey, mom, it's a boy dog. It also just reminds me of rewatching The Hangover and going, oh, wow, we talked very different back then. I've forgotten a little bit about uh, the slurs or whatever else and just how everyone talked. Yeah, it's extremely male. I, I hate to always refer back to the Bechdel test because it's not always the best term or whatever else. But this, I don't believe, passes the Bechdel test. Maybe oh. Megan Fox talks to the British woman in the military no, at one point. They never even – they never interact. Sam's mom says something to Michaela. And she's yeah. like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. But it's in reference to their son. So it's like <laughs> – Oh, when she thinks passing. he's beating off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's the one time. Yeah. Extremely male – Extremely militaristic, extremely cool. So cool. What are some moments that you remember from the movie where you're just like, damn, that was cool? I think their attack on the highway is just too cool. Yes, the sliding transformations. Just Hell sliding yeah. transformations blowing through that bus that was used in all kinds of trailers. And then like before movie theaters, when they would tell you to silence your phone, they did that for a little while. Where I, that was just too cool, at least to me. That was pretty amazing. I think the fight in the middle of downtown L.A. was very well done. And you have Starscream ripping through the streets. You have everyone jumping off of buildings. I think that was a fantastic scene. Bumblebee being pulled behind the tow truck. I'll drive you, shoot. I'll drive you. There's just too many of these cool moments. Some of them for the military. So here's a couple that I, that I found. One, you've got Captain Lennox, who is drives a motorcycle down the street with a gun, and then so does an Akira slide, slides underneath the, the legs, between the legs of this helicopter transformer, and yeah. then shoots up into him all the while he's screaming, and then he slides into home, and then he's laughing maniacally as the thing dies. <laughs> what a moment. Yeah, that was a pretty great moment. I, I think a lot of the military moments were calling something in just tech garble, and having something show up with just the biggest gun. When they're fighting the Scorpion, it's A-10 Warthogs. And I love planes. We've talked about it, Masters <laughs> of the Air. I'm like, oh, baby, show me the Warthogs. Gatling gun, missiles. Okay, they fly off. Then they're calling the C-130, which everyone who played Call of Duty knows from that massive cannons, 105 shells. And this thing's just pounding the dirt. And It's all CGI. It's all CGI. That's not a real Scorpion there. But as you're watching it, it's just too cool to watch. You're like... Yes. And then at one point, Lennox says, we can't do this without the Air Force, Mr. Secretary. Get the Air Force online. And I, okay, I have never in my life thought we can't do this without the Air Force. <laughs> Even an Independence Day. All right, guys, let's get in our planes and go fight them. No, no, he specifically is calling out Branch. Branch is best. Go. It just, it was cool. But yeah, it is militainment. So this is certainly something that that is that both in Michael Bay's films, but also in Battleship. The military is cool. The government is dumb. Yes. And everything from the NSA signal analysis, who are upstaged by a bunch of kids. Yep. 
And some guy in his backyard or who's living with his mom can do something that the NSA literally can't do to Sector 7, John Turturro, are these government spooks who are actually responsible for everything that bad that's happening currently. Yeah, if ever you wanted to start a coup, Transformers would be a really good start to get the people yeah. on board. <laughs> I was just thinking of like Bush and his second term coming to an end by 2007 and everything going on there and not great approval ratings for multiple reasons. And this did feel a little like, hey, everyone. <laughs> Military's cool again. The president's cool because he used the military. Yeah, not Secret Service, not Roswell or Area 51 or anything else. They were like, nah, it's the real servicemen who are the heroes. Yeah, not the corporate folks in suits. At one point, John Void says to John Turturro, you don't want to get in their way. These guys don't know how to lose. And I was like, okay, there's your slogan <laughs> right there. That's your recruitment tactic. <laughs> These guys don't know how to lose. That is so funny. Yeah. Let's talk for a second about our criteria, because we've already hit some of it, but yeah. for all of our movies in Militame, we're going to talk about, are there cool or badass lines for the military or on behalf of them? This one, of course, is a yes. We've already given a bunch. Yeah. The second criteria, does the military lose more than once? And in what fashion? Um, kind is, of. Yeah, I have the beginning they lose. You have a couple more times in the desert or like... Yeah mess up at the hoover dam the third one is the military instrumental in the final victory <laughs> yes beyond <laughs> instrumental are the servicemen veterans are they moral and good people or do they have a turn to become moral and reformed yes we've already hit it this Absolutely. is americana yeah. they are the most moral and the last one do they have stylistic shots and emotive moments with music imagery that shows off the military in a desirable way it's constant it's every time they're on screen I, I challenge you to find a shot that isn't stylistic and glamorizing. You have guys get hit, and it still looks like this Iwo Jima flag-raising moment of, we're going to yeah. be there, buddy. You're getting back to Fenway for a hot dog. It just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a no point where you're like, these guys suck, and they are going to lose. It's No, they're, they're kicking butt every time. What were some of your favorite lines? These guys don't lose. I've already said it. These guys don't lose. <laughs> When Lennox turns to Shia and says, you're a soldier now. Oh and my he, gosh, that is, yes. He hands him, he has the cube and he's like, hey, you're enlisted. I just think that was, yeah, fantastically done. What about you? That was his character arc. He went from some dumb high school kid to being a soldier. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah. And his masculinity was given back to him by a soldier on the battlefield. That has been handed down for thousands of years. <laughs> I think one of my favorite lines was when they're in the, they're on the way to Hoover Dam and Shia LaBeouf says, Bought a car, turned out to be an alien robot. Who knew? <laughs> Just like such a good like line delivery, funny. I think one thing that I did notice is that nothing in this movie would have, would get done if it weren't for the girls. Um, oh, interesting. Because like you've got the NSA, which is like inept in this movie. Yeah. And then the girl steals the steals the encryption or whatever and takes it to her friend. And then that's how they decode it. And then in the Hoover Dam bunker, when they're like, oh my gosh, all of our tech is analog and the, there's an EMP, so we can't use any digital signals. And she's like, we'll use Morse code. And you don't, like, you don't think the military guys knew to, like, to use Morse code? Thank heaven the woman's there with her big brain. I know. And then Megan Fox is like, she's the one that's like, oh, Bumblebee's legs are blown off. And Sam is just sitting there like, being like, I don't want to leave you. She's like, Bitch, I'm going to go get the tow truck and tie him up. And then we're going to go do the thing. Like, I got it. I got this taken care of. But then even when, uh, oh my gosh, this, okay, we'll come back to this. But the, in that, the initial alleyway scene when the Autobots are there and they're like just doing their info dump on Sam and Michaela, yeah. Sam is just like, wow, cool. And Michaela's like, so what are you here for? And she's moving the plot forward. The women are moving the plot forward in this movie. And there's probably some like meta textual reason for that behind like toxic masculinity or Michael Bay or whatever that just like the women are the yeah. ones driving the, the the narrative forward. That is interesting because you have Sam's mom, Judy Wibicki, who's the comedic foil. I guess both yeah. of his parents are both comedic, uh, but you're right. And I don't know if it, if it's respect for women being smarter than men or if it's almost like a token thing of like, here's your place in the movie. You can't be mad at me that the smart ones. Okay. Now you've had yeah. your spot. With these three men right in the movie, <laughs> my thought is definitely towards the latter. Who knows? One more quote I think I loved was the one where Optimus and Megatron are having this 
Jesus and Satan discussion in the wilderness. Humans don't deserve to live. And Optimus is saying they deserve to choose for themselves. He could have said they deserve to live. <laughs> But instead, he's saying, no, no, agency, remember, Judeo-Christian friends, this is what we're talking yeah. about. And then Megatron, then you will die with them, join them in extinction. I did find something interesting, by the way, in the trivia, that the first cut of the movie was another like 20 minutes plus, but it had all the Decepticons talking a lot. And one of the producers, Steven Spielberg included, was like, don't have your villains talk so much, it makes them less cool. We don't want to know what they're thinking. They don't need to be the bad guys, which is why we get I am Starscream, yeah. garble, 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 Megatron. That's all we get is because they uh, cut everything yeah. else. Faceless enemies. We just love a faceless enemy when we're talking about military. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Final thing that I have to say about Transformers and we can move on. There are so many cool moments that were put to screen from like everything from Starscream flying through Hoover Dam and then zooming up and then landing back on it. But my favorite scene in the entire movie is the arrival to earth scene where oh, it's, cool. it's almost spiritual. It's almost religious mm -hmm. where you've got these transformers like meteors falling out of the sky, landing in LA, whether they're at Griffith observatory and like you watch all of them land on the ground and then find a way to disguise themselves and everything from crawling out of the pool to uh, seeing the truck driving by and then slowly crouching down and transforming into the truck. Like it is a spiritual scene because the music, the soundtrack in this movie is so good. Yeah. Steve Jablonski knocked it out of the park. Yep. Just, it's amazing. So that arrival to earth scene, I think it's like, I don't know. It's a spiritual scene. You're right. It's angelic of sorts of like the angels have arrived. If we're talking Adam and Eve, we've left the garden, there's evil afoot. And then here they come from above. It was they used that scene, the trailer, a ton of the transformer coming out of the pool. And I remember like when I first watched yeah. the trailer, I'm like, are they going to kill a child by a pool? What is going <laughs> on here? But instead, it's this moment of it's so much bigger than humans. It's so much more advanced. It came from the sky. And you know, looks back with almost like a childlike wonder of, oh, there's our little humans. We better help them out. And also, product placement wise, the fact that these things are so badass and they're all GMC vehicles is killing me. But regardless, <laughs> we have the one Ford Mustang without a badge because they can't do that. Who's a bad guy? Everything else is all GM. Good work, GM. That was a good placement. Generations of kids have been buying Camaros now because of this movie. I know. Yeah, it's true. They did a good job. They did a good job. Okay, anything else for uh, Transformers? Enlist or Escape, what are you picking? Enlist. Enlist, 100%. <laughs> this makes me want to <laughs> This makes me want to enlist. Sign me up. Let's go 5 years in the future to another I want to say Transformers is Hasbro, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Another Hasbro influence thing that began as a board game, Battleship. Let's talk about Battleship. This movie was in development hell, I want to say, for a little while. So the fact it got made finally was great. And I just remember the trailer was big name actors, uh, Liam Neeson, and I had yeah. no idea what was going on with it. I was like, okay, they're in the water. Are we just going to play Battleship on screen? And they do. And they do. And it works. I, yeah. So I, when I was watching this, I was like, holy cow, we've got Jesse Plemons. We've got Rihanna. We've got yeah. a and Liam Neeson. There's so many actors, so many big name people in this movie. And I think I remember texting you after I watched it, and I was like, "Dude, Battleship fucks hard. <laughs> it's so good." <laughs> I watched it with my fiance in the room, and all she could say was, "This is a boy movie." She was like, this is quintessential boy. This is explosions. This is dumb plot. This is sweat. This is thirsting after other men. This is a boy movie. And it's true. It is definitely a boy slash any girl who loves militainment or just sweaty dudes on a boat. It, it yeah. really fulfills that. Yeah. How is it only a 5.8 on IMDb? That's my real question. I think if we had recontextualized the movies of the 2010s with our current lens, we're in this weird theater hell of yeah. quintuple sequels and just bad Netflix movies that we're passing off with $300 million budgets, it would be looked at differently. No, I, I definitely. Right. If you watch The Gray Man, I like this more than I like The Gray Man. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's a great scale. <laughs> but I think it's above <laughs> a 5.8 now. It should be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so if Transformers was military porn, this is without a doubt Navy porn. 100%. It just is. There's no unflattering look at anything that the mili- that that the Navy is doing. It's just like, oh, you guys are in Hawaii and you're doing Navy drills with other countries. Wow, yeah. that seems it, it seems like summer camp, and you guys are playing soccer together. Wow, this seems so fun. <laughs> um, can I do a two minute recap on the yeah. movie itself, real quick? Yep. Let me just talk first about Peter Berg. Peter Berg is an interesting character because he has done some intense and crazy movies that are completely unrelated. The Kingdom, okay, Hancock with Will Smith, Friday Night Lights, the movie, and two of the episodes he directed. Lone Survivor, more military porn. Deepwater Horizon, veterans working on an oil rig porn. Okay. Patriot's Day, of course, more patriotism there. Anyways, storied history all over the place tonally. It definitely fits on Battleship what he's doing here, but he has been all across the gamut. The writers, John and Eric Hober, did Red and Red 2, which I love. The Meg. Are you a fan of The Meg? No. Okay. Yeah. Not a big shark guy. My Spy. Fun. Transformers Rise of the Beast. Okay. More militainment there. Meg 2. And My Spy, The Eternal City. He has a little experience with Dave Batista. Thank you. As far as the cast goes, Taylor Kitsch as Lieutenant Alex Hopper. He was in line to be the guy. And because of this failure and John Carter, he completely got relegated to a different level of actor, but he was going to be the Brad Pitt. He was going to be our American hero. Honestly, it breaks my heart because watching this, Taylor Kitsch is so fun. His ability to deliver lines in really funny ways. In the beginning, he gets, he gets tased. And then you cut to the next morning when he's waking up hungover. And he's like, oh, my back hurts. Like, is something wrong? And he's just got this gaping hole in his back. And I'm just like, dude, the line delivery is so good throughout this entire thing. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we can do something on John Carter later. But I actually love John Carter. And I think that a lot of people slept on it. And I feel... I, I wish that we lived in the timeline where Taylor Kitsch was was a big rising star still. That'll be our movies that you miss series. We'll definitely do a John yeah. Carter one there because, again, I think if it came out this year in a good time frame with the right marketing, yeah. it would have been a hit. But yeah. it's just there's so many questions there. Alex Skarsgård, an early movie for him and the American cinema foray. We see him later in Godzilla and all kinds of other things. Um, lots of TV shows where he plays really wacky characters, Atlanta, whatever. Um, Brooklyn Decker as Sam. Liam Neeson as Adam Shane. Ad, sorry, Admiral Shane. Rihanna, like you said, as Petty Officer Cora Weps. Rakes, just weird names. And Jesse Plemons as Meth Damon on a Boat. <laughs> <laughs> With a $209 million budget, worldwide gross was $303 million or so. That's where it becomes a little bit of an issue. If they were still paying PA the 50% rate or whatever else, if they were doubling the price of the movie with print and advertising, that's an issue. I think these days you can get away with less, especially because the marketing cycle is so small. Now we're doing like six week to three month to six month windows the longest. It would have been less. But yeah, not bad to say you made $300 million, just rough that it was a $209 million budget. Okay, like you said, Navy porn. The Navy granted Peter Berg and Universal extensive access to all their military facilities in the area of Hawaii and San Diego and Louisiana. They were just like, go ahead, just make it look cool. Cast and crew members also got to spend time at sea on military boats to get a taste for their role and demands. Again, that's a little special help given there. And in a bulletin sent to the Navy recruiting offices, they noted that whether or not we actually supported Battleship, this film was going to be made. So it might as well carry our brand and represent who we are to the American people in the right way. And we can't take everyone out onto our ships, but we can work with Hollywood to bring the Navy to life on the big screen for them. Consequently, it's in our best interest to engage with and make sure the movies like Battleship accurately portray who we are and what we do as a Navy. Huge PR statement, all that to say. They wanted to make sure it looked really cool and that it got people to enlist. And I think, at least in my eyes, it would have done so for someone who may have been on the fence. Yeah, no, I would agree. Honestly, this movie is so funny. Yeah. Like like the script writing and the acting, I thought it was just – it was so well done. Like, yeah, it is funny. Like the more we talk about it, the more I'm like – yeah, that's super right that in the in kind of our movie landscape today, 
movies like these would have just would just kill right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're original. Yeah, it's it's based on some board game conceit, right? But it's like an original plot with original characters and it's just like it's just fun. And they didn't really there's no they didn't have a sequel probably because it didn't do very well. Yeah. But not a lot of sequel potential, very standalone. And just so many good like character moments all throughout. In in a jokey movie about Han Solo is in the Navy and now he gets to join and save the day with a boat, it does a great job at hitting all those moments of disappointing the brother. Oh my gosh, you've lost some loved ones. Now you got to get them back, but you have to earn the trust of your comrades. How are we going to do it, folks? The emotional keystone of bringing in the veterans. I was just like, oh my gosh, they're doing it. There's just a lot of those quieter moments or like you said character driven just dialogue moments that just prove out the writing of yeah they wrote it well there's some funny lines in there too like you said a lot of good humor but this the team here wanted to make something epic and i think they did yeah they did and so in in kind of contrast to michael bay transformers i feel like it's funny that to me the men in this movie that save the day are the ones that are dumb Okay, and the yeah. ones that are hyper competent are the ones that end up dying. Like, well, what do you think they're trying to say there? I don't know. I think I think it's trying to appeal to this American cowboy, dumb, wild card character who's also wielding the force of order and using it chaotically. I think there's some kind of the American mythos cowboy energy in that. Yeah, because Liam Neeson is like the he's the admiral. And his character gets sidelined almost immediately by the conceit of having the aliens producing this like force field around all of Hawaii and locking out most of the Navy. The brother, who's the other hyper-competent guy, gets killed. Yeah. And the other boat gets killed. And now you're left with Taylor Kitsch's character, who somehow becomes the captain of this boat. And the entire movie thus far has demonstrated that he's reactive. He's also a little dumb. And he doesn't understand strategy Uh, (laughs) to me it was very much like the star high school football player who's destined for a life at maybe community college but mostly blue collar jobs not that there's anything wrong with that there's anything wrong with that but the trope of it that's what you're getting here of i think once again if you're talking about (laughs) what the movie might be trying to do when it comes to propaganda it's leaving a place for the meathead who's just gutsy and who's not afraid to do something even if it's the wrong thing yeah, and that's what this movie is all about. Like you're saying, Lieutenant Hopper is just dumb. Him breaking into that convenience store at the beginning, mocking up that <laughs> YouTube thing. What are we proving here? He just loves getting drunk and doing he, stupid things. Okay. No, he was so horny. He needed to break in to get a breakfast, a, br- a burrito for this girl. That's what it proves that we'll do well, anything for love. Friends, we've all been there. We have all been there there when we've broken into a convenience store for a burrito. Yeah, but you know what? At the same time, Taylor Kitsch makes him lovable. Which is so hard to lovable. do, but he makes him yeah. lovable. Yeah. And like even uh, Nagata, the other, the Japanese sailor yeah, from Shogun, by the way, both of them are, they're obviously foils for each other in the movie, but still that like dumb, hyper reactive strain of male that ultimately ends up saving the day. Yeah. So I, that, that's something that I definitely noticed was because there, there are a lot of moments where like the art of war is met, is referenced and yeah. he's like, Oh, like fight them where they're not. And he's like, that's not what that means. And anyways, you folks, you just have to, you have to watch the movie to really get the humor in this movie. But here's what I did notice. Also, there's a lot of fridge logic to the conceit of the movie. Yes. And it's built in for, to give our heroes moments, to give them big damn hero moments. Like, yeah. like for instance, the one where they're actually number one, the the biggest conceit of the movie was, we need to find out a way for them to actually play Battleship and to call out B-12, like C-52 or whatever, right? So they're using uh-huh. the buoys, the tsunami warning buoys to track the water displacement of these alien craft in the water because it's, it's dark. And for some reason, their radar can't pick them up in the dark. And anyways, it's just – it's such a fridge logic can see, <laughs> but it's fun. It is fun, yeah. It's fun because then they're actively doing it. And then the enemy – missiles look like the little pegs in battleship that you put on to to, yeah. to point out a hit but then the last ship that they're trying to kill in the morning they're like oh these things have a tro- have problem with sunlight 
And so what do they do? Like they go to the they're the top of their deck with sniper rifles. <laughs> <laughs> and then right as the sun crests the, the peak of Hawaii, they shoot the sniper rifles at the window to break the window so the sunlight comes in and blinds the, the characters on the inside. And then they blow up the ship with their guns on the boat. And why did they not use the guns on the boat to blow up the window in the first place is beyond me. I'm just like, <laughs> that scene made no sense at all, but damn, was it cool. Yeah, there's a moment where you're like, this is the writer asking their seven-year-old son with his Lego setup to fix the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Between, and even all the setup, the ships crashing into the satellites beaming a, hey, we're Earthlings, come find us to a planet of reptilians who are like, all right, we coming. The weird setup that we have to have our scientists do something. So our scientists and our prosthesis veteran have to do something they can do. And you know what? We're going to kick ass in the mountains. There's just so many moments where I'm asking, what are these reptilians doing? Rihanna calls them a Donald Trump, Mike Tyson hybrid. And it made me sad about <laughs> both of those. Woof. Little did they know. The war room is extremely cheesy, no matter what, but it works. The suits that these guys are wearing look like Halo or Doom. It was like very quick and easy pull. But you're yeah. like, you know what, though? No match for the American military with a strong right hook and a sniper rifle across the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention wind. Or then they're dropping an anchor and turning the boat backwards. And of course, I had to Google. I was like... I was is called Kill Holland. Is this physically possible? And they're like, it is possible, but not the way they show it in the movie. That's dramatic. Yeah. I was like, but still fun. Oh, wait, no, it's called Club Holland. Club Holland. Not Kill Holland, Club Holland. Next time you're out on the, the lake, fellas, just to start Club Holland and shooting beers at your friends. Yeah, and here's what I thought now that we were talking about it. What is so funny is you get these aliens, these space aliens that land into the ocean and there's so much more our technological superiors and they land in the ocean. Then they prevent the rest of our Navy from like interacting with them. Yeah. Not only does like just a ragtag team of probably not the best the Navy has to offer. Definitely not the best the Navy has to offer. Not only do they sweep up and get solve the entire problem, but that if the aliens hadn't created that force field, they would have gotten destroyed by yeah. our Navy. Like, the end. Welcome to Earth. We're going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny because I would love to see, and maybe this is something that we just have to write ourselves. I would love to see a movie where we're from the perspective of the alien planet and the United States sends three interdimensional destroyers and just plops them in the ocean. It's like, cool, time to kill everybody and they kick our ass because I think it's only fitting that once again, if we're just going to go back to the sniper rifle, these things traveled across galaxies and yet <laughs> yet a 308 round or even a 50 caliber round from a sniper, they're like, oh, we could not have expected a projectile. Sorry, forget about all of the asteroids. A bullet, though, a bullet is going to pierce this window. Why do they need windows? Anyways, it's... But you know it, what? It was cool, though. It was cool. It was really cool. And that's and the point of this big movie. Big damn hero moments. Yeah. <laughs> This movie is Americans are heroes. When we have yeah. the old veteran, that's probably one of my favorite lines if we're going to talk about quotes now, if we're going to move into that. <laughs> the fact that Hopper says to these old ass veterans, you men have given so much to your country and no one has the right to ask any more of you, but I'm asking. And this old guy is just like, what do you need, son? Okay, these guys are on so many medications. <laughs> They're eating their porridge, and they take to that boat like it's yesterday, and it is fun to watch. You're like, yeah, Grandpa, kick his ass. But you it's know what? I believe it. That's not a conceit to me. Like, I think if you were to give those guys a chance to wield their boat against an alien, I think they would, in a heartbeat, do everything that we saw in that movie. After watching Masters of the Air, it was a good reminder. I was like, oh, <laughs> once a member of the armed forces, always a member of the armed yeah. forces. Yeah, because you know what? That, that scene... I think it's my favorite scene in the entire movie because it's got ACDC Thunderstruck as the background song and it's the arrival to Earth scene in Battleship where the music is so good and it's so much fun to watch them getting the ship going again. Yeah. And once you, when you just buy into the conceit of what's happening, you're like, damn, this is actually really cool. And then they're just like saying things to the vets. They're like, 
oh, so we're going to be firing at the island of Oahu? Like, holy shit. And then it's just like, what is happening right now? But it is the like the coolest thing on earth. And then you watch the ship come out into shore and there's almost like a, a little bit of a wonder with Hopper as he's like going through checking things and the camera's following him and he comes up out on the balcony and the way the, the boat crashes through a wave and it just sprays everywhere while Thunderstruck is playing. And I'm just like, holy shit, where, where can I sign up? Yeah. Like, I want to do it. I'll, <laughs> like, get me on the boat. Get me on the boat, sir. Get, get your bald eagle tattoo and it's time to join. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. And if we're talking about lesser plot point or characters, but still there, the Japanese Navy men who are part of this exercise, yeah. by the way, real Japanese soldiers used as extras in a lot of the scenes, okay? Or sailors, not soldiers. But you have this moment of Captain Nagata seems to have his shit together. But it's him who's saluting ragtag Han Solo Hopper. Yeah. And they have this moment where it's like, hey, it was an honor serving with you, Captain. And Nagata says to him, no, the honor was mine. And at the same time, that oil rigging boy from West Texas, he's done it. <laughs> he is the badass. I wish it wasn't so cool. But yeah, it is cool. It is so cool. I think that's what, like, the point of this episode is that, like, the rule of cool supersedes almost every critical thought that I have about a movie. Yeah. That that's probably the problem when it comes to propaganda and militainment. Yeah. If it just didn't look so damn cool, it wouldn't be convincing. Yeah. You're just not convinced to join I, I can't even think of something because it's all boring if you don't have something cool with it. The EPA, there's no good uh, um, <laughs> propaganda. Yeah, join the Peace Corps. Why? Because we're awesome. If you're joining for other reasons, it's going to be for other reasons, but not because it looks cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that both of these movies really hammer in, oh yeah, baby, it's cool. The end of Battleship, at least for me, is the exclamation mark. It's everything we're talking about in Militainment. They play Fortunate Son over the credits. And it's the greatest <laughs> song and example, one of the greatest, top two, of Americans either not having any critical thought to pick out what's actually being said or just not caring if they do know. Because Fortunate Son and Born in the USA are the most anti-war songs out there. Those are not songs that say that we're happy to be going to war. And yet we play them over things that are about war and we're like, yeah, America. Hell yeah. So yeah, that was my some, big cringe. <laughs> yeah, something else that I really cringed out of this one. There's a lot of white people in Hawaii. Where are the Hawaiians at? All of the shots of... You've got these alien ball things that are like destroying infrastructure throughout Oahu. Almost every interaction that has with civilians is with white people. And like at the Veterans Center, it's almost yeah. all white people. At yeah. In the Navy, it's almost all white people. I'm like, if you go to Hawaii, you're going to know that it's not just white people. There are Hawaiians there. Like, where are they? And the only two Hawaiians that they actually showed were these two cops that got smoked by these aliens up in the mountain. I'm just yeah, like, not, not get great. it together, guys. Uh, yeah, a big Polynesian population, a large... Chinese and Japanese, Hawaiian, pop, yeah. native Hawaiians, intermixed or otherwise, it did feel more like, you ever see The, the Descendants with George Clooney? Yeah. 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 I was like, wow, talk about just predicting the future. Let's just whitewash Hawaii because maybe in 30 years, it'll look even more like that. But not a great look. Also, knowing they filmed in San Diego and Louisiana with, with real naval members and everything else shouldn't they have just gone to some of these things and then casted yeah. i will say this for all the crap we give directors producers writers okay casting directors need to have a swift kick in the pants because <laughs> it is so often their fault of we're looking for this what says stupid but dutiful okay jesse plemons that could have been anybody <laughs> And I'm glad they have Rihanna on there, but also she got a Razzie for this. So, like, <laughs> her acting wasn't amazing. Her character was very just funny but weird. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, could we have, like, maybe another main character who was not the prosthetically enhanced general? Yeah. Or just proper we, representation. Yeah, proper representation. Especially, I don't know, because when I – last time I went to Hawaii, I – and this is maybe – no, this is probably on topic. When you go to Oahu, you really realize – that Hawaii is occupied territory. Yeah. And that the US government is occupying a place that isn't ours. 
And the threat of military violence is all over the place, not only because there's military bases on the island, but there's helicopters and planes flying over all the time. And it's stressful. That's like a real threat of violence. As white people, we don't see it like that. We're like, oh my gosh, look at our place. Look at our machines. But if you're a Hawaiian living there who's you know been there for generations, and you know this shit, like the Navy stuff in Hawaii, is just a huge symbol of your occupation there. And I think that's something that like I didn't see until much later in my life. And I was like, oh, Hawaii is occupied territory. <laughs> it's so funny because before watching this, like probably a week or two before, I had just watched a little mini doc, I want to say, on, on YouTube that was super informative about the island of Kahoalawe, which is this sacred area for a lot of the tribes there, that the United States government sold to themselves for one dollar mm. to use as a designated arms test site mm. now here's the thing it's a sacred site they want it back but now even if we wanted to we couldn't give it back because we never go out and destroy unexploded ordnance we just leave it there so we've got this huge area in hawaii where the military is just dropping bombs shells and then just leaving it it's a little oh. frustrating yeah I think in terms of militainment, this movie ends on a fantastic note because Hopper and his boat, the Missouri, they blow up the shield generator, which then lowers the shields, which gives Liam Neeson and the rest of the Navy fleet a chance to say, I want every available plane in the air right now. (laughs) And then they fly in and they destroy the remaining aliens with a snap of their finger. And it's like, yes, hell yeah, America. We did it. We killed them. We cleaned them up. We cleaned them up. All that practice on the test site was worth it. Ton, tons of badass lines. I know we've already given a handful. The military loses more than once. So yeah, I want to say we definitely have yeah. a sinking ship, have another one. But do they come back in the end? Of course they do. Are they moral and good people? Look, Hopper's the most dubious of them. And even then, he stole a burrito and he's a playboy. It could be much worse. They probably would have liked him to be a little less hand Solo. But he has a nice comeback where he's going to get the daughter's hand. He's going to really prove the Admiral wrong. And then tons of silent shots and emotive moments. Beautiful. Yeah. All the way through. Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Are you going to sign up or are you going to to leave? I think Transformers is more convincing. Battleship makes the Navy seem pretty great. Yeah, it does. Sign me up. Sign me up. As as long as ACDC Thunderstruck is playing in the background, like, dude, put me on the boat. I want it. For our next episode, we have the most enlisting movies of all time, which is Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick. Hell yeah. I wish I had more current numbers to see what enlistments look like after Maverick. I'm going to see if I can find those. But I think these movies are stylistic. They're great. And again, they make it all look very fun. Where I think Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick have a little different story there. Family or relationships or friends or whatever else tied into why you need to join so it'll be fun for us to dig into that yeah but i think we can certainly underline it with this episode that this is about the rule of cool michael bay and battleship and transformers it's about the rule of cool with propaganda so if you want to watch some cool movies go to our show notes i've got it listed there battle battle you can watch on peacock and transformers is available on paramount plus plus you can rent vod anywhere else and then before next episode make sure you watch top gun and top gun maverick take any notes send us an email or an instagram dm tell us what you think about it we'll also post some stuff on our story and we hope you keep watching good movies whether they be militainment or not 